Glory Cloud Podcast, episode 174. Well, stay tuned for more Christ in the Old Testament from Genesis this week. Welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahey, and I'm joined by our co-host, Pastor Todd Bordeaux of Cornerstone Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. How are you, Todd? I'm doing well, considering all the craziness. I, I'm glad to take some time and we can just talk Old Testament. Yes. Uh, and considering that this is take, what, 58? I can't, I lost count. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Todd and I have experienced some technical difficulties today. <laughs> um, but yeah, looking forward to uh, a large chunk of Genesis today. Yep. Yeah, okay. So before we dive right into that, I will just uh, run through our regular housekeeping, reminding our listeners that we do have our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. There you can find all of the resources that we mentioned during the course of an episode. Uh, we would sure appreciate it if you would give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and to subscribe to the podcast on whatever you use to listen to it. Both of those things really help to boost our visibility for other people who are looking for good theological content in their podcasts. And finally, if you have the means to pitch in a little bit of money to help us cover the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can find a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right-hand side of the page. And any amount that you can give is very... Uh, encouraging to Todd and me really does help. And um, if you don't like the PayPal option behind the donate button, just reach out to us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com and we can work something else out. But having said all of that, Todd, how should we get off the ground with our discussion this week? Well, let me start by just giving our listeners a few resources if they want to do some reading or listening as far as a walk through the Old Testament with the approach that we're taking. Uh, you, Voss's Biblical Theology is probably the most well-known. Um, Ed Clowney's Unfolding Mystery. Um, I actually had preaching through the Old Testament with Ed Clowney in seminary, and some of that was from his book. Very good book. Uh, Lee Irons on his website, um, on his upper register site, has a series called The Unfolding Mystery, the same idea. And then uh, Tremper Longman and Ray Dillard have an introduction to the Old Testament. And it's not a thorough exegetical work. It's more of a summary of each book. But they do get into the more redemptive historical purposes of each book, which is helpful. Even in sometimes we disagree with how they interpreted certain books. But as a whole, that's a good work. Okay. And I think over time, as we go through the Old Testament, we'll... We'll mention um, we'll mention different resources for the books we're looking at. Very good. So we're going to try to tackle tonight, as you said, a big chunk. We're going to tackle Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, so we can finish Genesis tonight. And obviously, we're just going to be able to look at the highlights. And um, so I'm going to walk through them fairly quickly to get through this, and then we'll stop. And and oh, I'm going to ask you thoughts on each one. Isaac is usually the character who gets shortchanged because, you know, we think of Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and we know their stories and there's not much written about Isaac. And what is written is not very overly dramatic compared to some of the other stories. So Isaac gets shortchanged and part of that also is that he only takes up about three chapters in Genesis compared to the other um, patriarchs. And so Isaac is in the middle, of course, of the promise to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we have the promise to Abraham, summarized, we said last time, as a land for them, and then descendants or seed. And we talked about the two stages or levels of that prophecy, the typological and Old Testament temporary level where the land would be Canaan and the seed would be the Israelites 
um, the ethnic Israelites. And then that was fulfilled, of course, with believers in Christ, truly Abraham's children on a spiritual level. And Canaan ends up, of course, being typological of heaven, our promised land. And we saw how the other importance of, of the fact that this is given to Abraham is that it is through Abraham that the Messiah would be born. He would be the one to bring about the eternal blessings that the types only pictured. And so we're tracing the promise both on a typological level and ultimately bringing about Christ and the fulfillment. And so Isaac fits in first with his birth. His birth is all of grace. And that's the point that Paul brings out in Galatians 4. That Isaac's birth was supernatural. It was not by works. Abraham worked in a sense. He needed to have relations with his maid to produce Ishmael. But Isaac was produced supernaturally um, because obviously uh, um, Sarah couldn't have children. And so Paul uses that as an example of grace, of supernatural grace, that well, the fulfillment of that is us being born again into God's spiritual family is all through God's grace and not through any man's works. And so even Isaac's name, Laughter, it's, it's a laughter of amazement. You could say that a lie. The laughter is amazing grace. Hmm. As Abraham and Sarah laughed with joy that God would produce this child. So his birth is pointing to the new covenant that the fulfillment of this, God's spiritual children of the spirit would all be born of supernatural grace into the true Israel. Now, as we said, it's really chapters 24 through 26 that Isaac is mentioned. And so the first problem, of course, is if Isaac is going to be the one who continues the covenant line, he's going to need to have a believing wife. That, I mean, if the kids start worshiping idols and become like the nations, there's no more covenant line. Right. And so that's obviously an issue because they, he couldn't take a wife from the nations there. And so you can see the great concern of Abraham and Sarah that Isaac um, have a wife. And so it's Abraham who sends his servant uh, back to Haran, of course, to find a wife for him. And of course, that's where Abraham left the family that traveled with him, at least from Mesopotamia. So there would be some who believed in the true God, as it, Abraham explained to them. But what's interesting about it is how passive Isaac is in this whole chapter. It's Abraham who is finding him a wife. It's the servant of Abraham doing all the work in a sense. Isaac doesn't speak. Um, Rebecca speaks. And so God is providing. And when Rebecca comes and sees Isaac, Isaac still doesn't speak. Hmm. So Moses is setting up Isaac in a very passive sense as the recipient of the promise. But he's not doing much or saying much. And again, that's the theme that's emphasized in that. That Isaac is simply by grace receiving. And some have argued, and I think it's a good argument, we don't want to take typology too far. But in the search for Isaac's bride, we have a type of the gospel. That the father is Abraham, who would then picture God the father, finding a bride for his son. And so he sends his servant to prepare a bride. And isn't that what God does in the gospel? He sends his spirit to prepare people for the gospel of his son. And they receive him and they become his bride. So again, you don't want to overdo it with typology, but I think we do see a picture of the gospel here in the beginning. But the point is that opposed to Abraham, who's very active and he speaks, Isaac appears simply receiving. And so that's going to be the theme of Isaac. He, he does not take center stage uh, throughout his life. Very quietly um, does Isaac appear. But God is always providing for him as he promised. 
let me stop there and ask you any thoughts so far. Yeah. Um, I heard a sermon on this that I thought was uh, fascinating because uh, the, the preacher said that uh, there are the same elements of this story. Uh, and if you, if you read Genesis 24, you read the story of um, this servant of Isaac going and meeting Rebecca at a well, right? Isn't yes. that okay? Yes, and, yes, it is at a well. And uh, so this this sermon that I heard made the case that those the same elements of that story we find in John chapter four with the woman at the well. Uh, a man meets a woman at a well, and even afterward, I think in both stories there's a big um, feast. I want to say, um, and. So I think you're on to something with the typology there because even in that story in John chapter 4, um, Jesus is taking the gospel to those outside of Israel. I mean, you have the Samaritans at that point, um, and you have people coming to faith in him as a result of this woman going into the town saying, I've met this guy that I knows my whole story. I can't believe it. You've got to come and hear what he has to say. Um, so I think there's something to that. Hmm. By the way, the exact city I meant to say was Nahor. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, I think that, well, like I said, it doesn't actually say, but there's so many parallels with the gospel that it's, it's, it's fascinating, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. So in chapter 25, as we move on with Isaac, Rebekah, his wife, is barren. And so again, Isaac doesn't speak. He prays. He, he prays to the Lord for help. And, and that shows he's, he's different than his father in that sense. Abraham, of course, schemed and had relations with his servant. Isaac seems to have learned from that. And he understands grace in, in that it has to be the Lord providing, and so he simply prays and trusts the Lord. But it's interesting when God speaks to them about Jacob and Esau, he speaks to Rebekah and not Isaac. He has to hear from Rebekah the word of the Lord. I find that fascinating, this passivity again with Isaac, um, as he's not the one that directly gets the revelation. Now, Isaac seems not to believe Rebekah because it says he loves Esau. In a sense, he favors Esau, and he was ready to give Esau uh, the blessing when God had already said it's for Jacob. So we see again Isaac as a sinner. Um, he trusts the Lord, but not perfectly. He struggles. He's weak. And so the point then is that even with Isaac's sin and weakness, God is still going to provide because the promise was land and seed. Well, he's in the land. It's not his yet, but he's there. But he definitely needs a wife and children. And so God is making all that happen in spite of Isaac's own weakness and sin. And so that theme, again, seems to be the theme that God, by grace, is providing everything Isaac needs. Now, in chapter 26... It's the only time that Isaac leaves the promised land. Unlike both Jacob and Abraham, Isaac is born and dies in the promised land. And he's there all his life. And so, of course, Jacob ends up in, in Egypt. Um, but Isaac is the only one that lived his whole life in the promised land. But he takes one trip because of a famine to the border town in the, to the Philistines. And now for the first time, God speaks to Isaac, directly to Isaac. And, and yet, when he gets to the Philistines, he does commit the same sin of Abraham. He lies about his wife, thinking that Abimelech would take her. And so again, we see that God is by grace going to give Isaac everything, not because Isaac deserves it, but because God promised it. Now, what's really interesting about um, Isaac's life as it's written is what is left out and what is added because in chapter 26 we have this long passage from verses 12 to 32 
about watering rights. You think about a person who lives more than a hundred years, everything that could be written about him or, you know, lives a long time. And yet there's only two or three stories that the author inspired by the Spirit would would include in Scripture. And yet here, one of the longest stories is about argument over watering rights. So that tells us that if over 50 years, this is the one incident or the one situation, it must have value. Mm. And so the theme is Isaac is living as an alien in the land that's been promised to him. And yet we see that he really has no rights in the land because he keeps getting pushed around by the Philistines and you know they'll have a well for water the Philistines will take it over and they'll have to go somewhere else but eventually God intervenes and the Philistines become afraid of Isaac because God keeps blessing Isaac they probably assumed if they pushed him around enough he would either leave the land or have no livestock left but God keeps providing to the point where the Philistines believe that their God is with him. So there's even a foreshadowing here of God providing for his son. Um, but Isaac is pushed out over and over until finally um, the king of the Philistines comes and wants to make a covenant with him because he's starting to be afraid of Isaac because God keeps blessing him. God does appear once more during this time and that shows how important this whole series of events is that the Lord has to reassure him of the promise. So we really see the connection and why it's here because Isaac is living in a common grace situation where he's given the land but he doesn't own it yet. He's still a stranger and an alien and that's exactly our situation in the new covenant, right? Yeah, exactly. And so we learn a lot about Christian living in a common grace situation because when the king of Abimelech comes and wants to make a deal with him, Isaac doesn't um, destroy him. Isaac doesn't use his numbers or his, that newfound fear to threaten him. He seeks peace. Even though he's been persecuted, he does not fight back. He does not make demands. He seeks peace. And that's exactly what we're called to do in the New Covenant. To love our enemies, try to live at peace with all people, if at all possible, Paul writes in Romans 12. And so this whole section teaches us what it's like to live in a world that we've been promised but not given yet. And so in the New Testament, when, when we're he we hear that the patriarchs were aliens and strangers in a land promised but not yet given, and that's used to encourage us in the same situation. We see that this whole section of, in Isaac is for us in our living. So a lot here about common grace. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I appreciate that so much. Just because, you know, even if Isaac and his family had neighbors in, in this uh, promised land who were at least decent to them. I mean, I think all of us have had nice neighbors at, at some point. Uh, so we know what that's like. It's still, I, I appreciate what you said that, um, there are strangers and aliens in this land. They're, they're still going to stick out like a sore thumb because of their worship and because they belong to Yahweh. So, it's still not going to be a comfortable fit for them in this promised land because it's not a, it's not, uh, it hasn't been given to them by God yet. It won't until he leads Israel out of Egypt, but it's also not the real thing. Right. And so the fact there's no, uh, there's no Christian America thinking here, right? <laughs> Exactly. There's no, we're going to take over this land for God and you're going to be out and we're going to be ruling and you have no right with your unbelief. He, he very much is living as an alien and he's trying to live as much peace and working with them as possible, not demanding his rights, 
Yeah. So I mean, by Christian America, you mean that they're not trying to make the the city or the air, the country that they live in holy. Right. Isaac's not going to rush the Lord and try before the Lord fulfills that promise to try to make it happen through politics or through fear. Um, Isaac is going to wait on the Lord to bring in the kingdom, but he's going to live as an alien then and as a stranger, not demanding them serve him in that sense. Very good. All right, so a couple more thing in Isaac's life as we close this section is his faith certainly wavers and it is weak at times, but it's true faith, so it perseveres. At the end of his life, he still is serving the Lord. Um, God's faithfulness, though, is the key. He made a promise to Abraham and he is fulfilling it to Isaac. And Isaac most often is simply a passive recipient of God's grace. God provides a wife, children in the land. So the land and seed promise continues as Isaac himself, especially his birth, but also his provision is a reminder that all the promises come supernaturally, ultimately by the grace of God and not by human works. Any other thoughts on Isaac before we move to Jacob? No, I'm ready to move on to Jacob. So Jacob's birth, if Isaac's birth was about grace, then Jacob's birth is about election. Because that's what, of course, Paul brings out in Romans 9. That everything that happens to both Jacob and Esau, we find out is beca it's because of election. Before they did good or bad, Paul writes, God had chosen one for salvation and passed the other by. Both of them deserve judgment, but God chooses one um, to be a, a to continue in the promised land and continue um, among His people. So it's unexpected who He chooses because typically the older receives the benefits, the inheritance, etc. But He chooses the younger. So God's election is not by human expectation not by works, but solely by the choice of God for his own purposes. And so that's the, the, the lesson of Isaac's, excuse me, Jacob's birth. Now in Genesis 25, the story of Esau selling his birthright is simply how historically this happened. Because when you first read it, Isaac is not uh, friendly with the idea that his firstborn son wouldn't receive the birthright wouldn't be the new leader of the community to continue on as, as the leader of the faith. And so Isaac's not going to make it happen. So And the law doesn't favor the, the secondborn. So how could it possibly happen? Well, Genesis 25 answers that. Esau sells his rights um, for stew, showing he doesn't care at all about these things. Now Jacob at first looks good because he wants the inheritance, but we find out soon enough that he wants it for carnal reasons. He's not interested in the spiritual dimension of leading them in the true faith, but he certainly wants, you know, the livestock, the leadership, um, everything that he can inherit as, as a firstborn would. So we see that both of them deserve judgment, but Jacob was elected by God's grace. And so chapter 27 is then the story of the deception of how the the um, inheritance is transferred to Jacob. And sometimes people wonder, who is the one in sin in Genesis 27? The father, the mother, Jacob, Esau. The answer is all of them. All of them. None, none of them are trusting the Lord. Exactly. All of them are scheming or Isaac is not receiving from Rebekah what God told her. Rebekah is scheming. Nobody is trusting the Lord to work out what he promised. And so the point of Genesis 27 is through all this family politics, intrigue, favoritism, etc., God is going to fulfill his promise. And in verse 36 of that chapter, Jacob is called a deceiver. And so Esau is right. That is Jacob's character. It's not only Esau. Jacob is a deceiver. 
So we see that God saves sinners. God elected Jacob, but Jacob is clearly a sinner. But this whole incident leaves us with some questions that the rest of the narrative needs to resolve. For one, Jacob needs a believing wife to continue now that he's the covenant head, the patriarch over the covenant community. He needs a believing wife for the faith to continue, and he doesn't have one. But even more, Jacob needs salvation because the promise, even the typological promise, is not really about land and seed. It's about knowing the Lord. But Jacob doesn't know the Lord. And so how is he going to pass on the faith if he himself doesn't believe? Of course, the other problem with that is the Messiah needs to be born from a believing community. So if Jacob doesn't believe and his wife doesn't believe, that covenant line could end pretty quickly if they're not interested in passing on the faith. And so it's, it's of great interest, not only for Jacob himself, but for all the promises that Jacob is transformed from an unbeliever to a believer. And that also shows us that if Jacob's going to live in the promised land, the promised land is first and foremost the presence of God. And to be in the presence of God, Jacob's going to need holiness. He's going to need conversion. And so really, from chapters 28 to 33, it, the whole thing is setting up Jacob's transformation to a believer who follows the Lord, because he certainly isn't when the whole journey begins. Any thoughts before we look at those chapters? I just marvel at what you were talking about in terms of here, here are God's people who don't believe God. <laughs> yeah. So God is working out his plan of salvation in spite of his people who don't believe him. It's just, it's unreal. Right. So chapter 28, we have Jacob leaving Israel for a believing wife. He's the one that goes to Haran, by the way, where some of Abraham's relatives would have stayed. And um, Jacob now leaves Israel for a foreign land and God would then bring him back. And that, Jacob, of course, Jacob name, his name becomes Israel. But Jacob's whole journey is a foreshadowing of Israel's journey. So Israel will be able to look back at their father and say, when, they were, when they're in the wilderness, remember how God led Jacob uh, to the promised land. Even though Jacob was waiting all those years, God still brought him. That would have been encouragement that his story becomes their story. Now, as he's leaving the promised land, of course, God appears to him at Bethel. And the covenant is affirmed again, reassured, just like God did with Isaac. But again, we see the very essence of the covenant is not only the physical typology, but the essence is fellowship with God. And so the heavens are open, angels descend on the ladder, and again, the idea that God is establish, establishing a relationship with Abraham's family, a, a saving relationship. They would know him by his grace. But Jacob was not quite ready to trust the Lord. So it's not clear if Jacob is converted at all by this. If he was, he still has very weak faith, as we shall see. Matter of fact, he marries Rachel. He doesn't seem to be very concerned because she still has household gods that she clings to. Mm. And so it doesn't seem like even the marriage uh, compared to Isaac, who really wanted to marry a believer, that Jacob is even concerned with that. Maybe Rachel outwardly professed in something in Jehovah, but she carried the idols with her. So, but Jacob is still deceiving. He's still relying on his own wisdom. There's no recorded prayer like we had Isaac's prayer when he was in trouble. There's no recorded prayer for Jacob through this whole um, 21 plus years. And then he meets his uncle Laban. And what's interesting about Laban is Laban is a deceiver. And so <laughs> Laban keeps tricking him just like he tricked his brother. Yep. And, and so it's like God holding a mirror up to Laban. It says, this is what you're like. This is the problem. 
But the amazing thing is God is seeking his salvation is to transform him. He's also providing for him. And so pretty soon we see with the whole story of, um, of, of Rachel and Leah and the other wives, um, we see Jacob provided for with flocks and the whole story of how God kept blessing him with all the flocks. And it wasn't really the, the point of all that about the sheep and the speckled sheep is not as much Jacob's wisdom, but God's provision. And so God is preparing him to be able to go back to the promised land and continue to lead the covenant community. And so it's the promise to Abraham that God is fulfilling to Jacob. And of course, God's election of Jacob. And it's interesting that God does not actually appear to Jacob outside the land until the very end in chapter 31, where he directs him to go back to the land. Again, the idea that God is very connected to the land of Canaan at this point hmm. in the Old Testament. So, before we get to the, really the main point, and I won't say the main point, but the chief story that changes him, any other thoughts on Jacob's journey? Um, no. Okay. So some other parallels, Jacob ends up plundering Laban, just like the Israelites plundered the Egyptians. Again, the stories are very similar. Laban is a threat, just like Pharaoh, trying to keep Jacob out of the land. Every time Jacob wants to go back, Laban finds a way to keep him from the land. When God finally frees him of Laban, Esau becomes a threat, his brother. He must pass through the land of Edom, Esau's country. And he's very fearful that Esau, for good reason, will seek his life. Right. God continues to pro protect and provide. But the, the main problem of Jacob's soul is finally settled in chapter 32. And that's the wrestling match. That's the key passage. Because it's right on the border of the promised land. But Jacob cannot go into God's presence and lead the people if he doesn't know the Lord if he himself has not been converted or transformed. And so Klein calls this wrestling match one of the trial by ordeals in the Old Testament. Remember, we talked about trial by ordeal in Kingdom Prologue. Yes. That often when, in the Old Testament times, when you wanted to prove the guilt and innocence of someone, you put them through a very difficult ordeal. If they survive it, then they're proven innocent. If they don't survive it, it shows they were guilty. So this is a trial by ordeal. If Jacob survives, we'll see that he knows the Lord. And so Jacob is wrestling at night what he assumes is a man, maybe a local man who's trying to hurt him. And, um, and I think Klein pointed out that wrestling matches were not uncommon, even in these trial by ordeals. But eventually throughout the night as Jacob is wrestling, he realizes that this is more than just a man. That while the man was not winning, he didn't seem to be lose. He wasn't losing either. He, Jacob realized the man was letting him win. So Jacob could keep fighting or he could realize that he was in trouble and, and beg for mercy. And for Jacob, that'd be the first time we see anything like this. And that's exactly what he does. He ends up striving not to win, but for grace. So he holds on to the man and pleads for grace. That's a very humbling moment for Jacob. He's admitting that in his own strength, he cannot do this. And so he needs the Lord. He's no longer at this point striving in the flesh. But now he's pleading for forgiveness and blessing. He's admitting his helplessness. So now he's ready for the promised land. He's ready to lead the covenant community in the faith. He's ready to go into the land of God's presence. And that teaches us that we must be justified and transformed or justified and sanctified uh, to enter God's presence. And that sanctification, we're, of course, is definitive. It's as soon as we're filled with the Spirit upon justification, we are, we are also fit for God's presence. And so it's interesting that God smites him at that moment in the socket of his hip. And I think Klein also points out that's Jacob's reproductive organ. Mm. 
We talked about how in circumcision, the cutting off of a portion of the reproductive organ, that, that idea appears again. In other words, Jacob's salvation will come through the suffering of his descendant, of someone that will come from his reproductive organ. And it's Christ who is smitten, that same word in the Hebrew, that Jacob was smitten in Isaiah 53. And so here we have a promise of the gospel, don't we? If you're going to be in my presence, there must be a death. And in this case, it won't be you, Jacob, but it'll be your descendant. And so now Jacob has a permanent injury. He will limp. That will remind him both of grace, that all he has from God is grace. If not, God would have destroyed him. But also that God would provide through another death from his family um, salvation. Now we see in chapter 33 that Jacob understood this time as God being appeased, that Jacob was justified because he compares the wrath of Esau with the wrath of God. And so he says Esau, by accepting his gifts, was appeased like God was appeased. And so Jacob looked upon this whole ordeal as God deserving, I mean, him deserving to die in God's presence, but God providing a way out. He was appeased. God's wrath was satisfied. Jacob was forgiven. And now he was transformed to be in God's presence. And we see how changed he is by really the end of the story, right? Because in Genesis 35, he's directing to come into community. He's telling them all, all his children, to serve the Lord. Chapter 49, he's pronouncing the prophetic blessings. <clears throat> and I, I just want to point out that how many people are like Jacob? God has elected them to life, but they spend many years fighting God, striving. And God may provide conviction and provision, but it's not till that moment they wrestle with God and they're defeated. Um, sometimes conversion is like that for many, especially um, those who grow up in the covenant community, but they're not, they don't know the Lord yet. Mm. Any thoughts on Jacob's wrestling before we close that section? Yeah, I love how you uh, pointed out the gospel there that it's not Jacob who would die, though he recognizes that he should have in this striving with God, but it's it's his descendant. Jesus, who will die in Jacob's place. But I also think about this story of the sleep uh, that he's in, where he sees the ladder that connects heaven to earth and the angels ascending and descending on the ladder, and how John interprets that in John chapter 1, that that is Christ uh, that connects heaven and earth. Yes. Um, so yeah, I love Thank that story. And I want to bring out one final point in Jacob that Klein brings out. And again, we're we're really skipping a whole lot of um, material. But when Jacob blesses Pharaoh at the end of his life, remember he's involved with Joseph and provision of food, but he blesses Pharaoh. And Klein points out you're seeing the difference between a theocracy where the kingdom is pictured, the final kingdom, and common grace before the the consummation is pictured because Moses never blesses Pharaoh. Now both are idol worshiping and both are considered gods and yet in the common grace era Jacob blesses Pharaoh. He wants the best for him. He's very respectful. Moses challenges him and so here's what Klein writes in Kingdom Prologue. The total contrast between this meeting of Jacob with Pharaoh and the confrontation of Moses with the Pharaoh of his day, the day of the coming of God's kingdom in judgment, illustrates graphically the pre-kingdom nature of the age of patriarchal pilgrims. And so we're not in the age to condemn our, our rulers and to want only believing or um, rule by the word of God. That is the age to come. 
or in the age of Jacob, blessing our rulers and wanting the best for them and um, working with them as much as we can if they would allow to do good. So that's such an interesting contrast, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. All right, let's just end with Joseph, and certainly we don't have time to go through his life. So all I'm going to do in closing is point out the typology in Joseph. Often people ask, and I think you brought this up, can we point to types in the Old Testament that the New Testament does not specifically say are types? Right. And the answer is yes. As long as we're careful, as long as it's obvious, as long as the themes are clear in the New Testament. So let me give you some examples. I'm going to read through the story of Joseph. And as I, and if I read through this, I'm simply going to summarize it. You keep thinking of Jesus and the parallels. He was the beloved son of his father. He was hated without a cause, especially by his own. Though he was lowly, he was promised to reign over his brothers. He was sent by his father, but rejected by his brothers. He suffered a punishment for sin he did not commit. He was raised out of prison by a miracle of God. He was then exalted to the right hand of the king and given authority over the kingdom. Then he offered forgiveness to those that sought his life. He then became the provider of bread for his people. And then the story ends learning that man's evil was used to accomplish salvation. Now, who was I talking about, Joseph or Christ? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, both. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. God is giving us, in preparation for the Messiah, the whole life of the Messiah. Yeah, definitely. So if we're going to preach Joseph, we preach Christ. First, we preach the contrast. Joseph was earthly. Jesus is heavenly. He's the true son of God. Joseph only helped people locally. Jesus helps people around the world. Joseph could only give physical bread. Jesus gives true spiritual and eternal bread. And so that's the whole life of Joseph is the life of Christ. Now, there's, there's so much more that we can glean. Of course, we don't have time for. But it is interesting that there's no prayer recorded of Joseph at all. Again, because Joseph spends most of his life outside the promised land. And so that theme that God is very connected, his presence is connected with Canaan. And so it's like the Esther motif where no prayers are recorded, but God's providence is the key. God is going to continue his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by providing for Jacob's family through Joseph. So Joseph becomes a Messiah picture, providing salvation for his family. And so, um, but Joseph believes all this himself because he wants to be buried back in the promised land like Abraham wanted to be buried. We talked about that last week. And so that's a summary of Abraham, excuse me, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And of course, all this is setting up the transition from Israel, um, from God's people being in Canaan to going down to Egypt, where the entire gospel will be seen in picture in the redemption from Egypt. But God had told Abraham, of course, in a prophecy that his people would end up in Egypt and be enslaved. So the unfolding of that prophecy is really the story of Joseph and the famine. And that would bring us then to Exodus next week. So we did it. We did it in pretty good time. What do you think? Yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would take longer, but any other thoughts on the beauty of seeing the gospel through all this, Chris? You know, I have... Um... I have not preached through Genesis, but I've wondered about how I would deal with certain aspects of Joseph's life. But I, I really appreciate how you picked some of those key elements from his life throughout the Genesis narrative that line up 
perfectly with the same elements from Jesus's life. So um, I'm going to put those in a maybe a table format so that uh, if you go to the show notes page, it'll be very visually uh, accessible to see how uh, Joseph's life lines up with Jesus's. I appreciate you doing that. Um, and just to remind the listeners that, like you said, we end the book of Genesis in Egypt. I think that's very important. Granted, they've gone through the the famine, but they're okay because of the planning and the provision that Joseph made. And, and that's basically where the story ends. Yes. So definitely is a kingdom prologue, isn't it? Yes. If you want to know why Klein named his book Kingdom Prologue, it's because the book of Genesis is the prologue to the great redemption event in the Old Testament, which is the Exodus. Good. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that discussion. All right. Thanks. And thanks for putting those notes up. Appreciate that. Sure. Um. Yeah, so we would really love to hear what you think about this as we venture outside of Kingdom Prologue territory. You can email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet at us. I am at Machen Guy. Todd is at T Bordeaux. The podcast itself is at Glory Cloud Pod. I'm also on Instagram as at Machen Guy. Um, you can also join the discussion over at the Meredith Klein Facebook group. Just let the admins know that you listen to the podcast and they can get you added. And Todd and I will be back again next week to talk about Exodus and how we see Christ there. 